So let's take a look at the urinary system. So here are the models that we would use, and we're going to see these in the PowerPoints too. Um, but the urinary system it looks like this one over here. So this is basically a general model of the urinary system. And then here's sort of another one right here, but it's really hard to see. Uh, but when you look at it, the urinary system is actually pretty simple because what it is is two kidneys, two ureters, a urinary bladder, and a urethra, and that's it. So when you look at it, here are the kidneys. There's a kidney, there's a kidney. Here are the ureters. These are tubes which carry the urine down. And then the urine gets stored in the urinary bladder, which is this. And then here's the urethra, which carries it to the external environment. So we're going to look at all of these. Well, of these, the most important things are these kidneys. So the kidneys are going to be doing the things that the urinary system does, which is it makes urine. Well, where does urine come from? Urine comes from your blood. And so what the, the kidneys are going to do is they're going to filter the blood. They're going to filter it. It happens about 60 times a day. So your entire blood supply gets filtered about 60 times a day, which means it's going to leave the, the circulatory system and enter into these kidneys. And then what's going to happen is we're going to adjust the blood. We're going to adjust it for all sorts of things. We're going to adjust it for volume. We're going to adjust it for concentration of all kinds of things like salts and and proteins and, and amino acids and stuff. We're going to remove the things that we want to remove, like waste products. And then we're going to return all of that refreshed blood back to the circulatory system. And what we're going to take out of it is called urine. And so the whole point of this is what's called urine formation. And that's this whole process. Filter take out the things we want to take out, put things we want to put back in, and make urine. And then the urine then is going to travel down these tubes, and it's going to get stored in the bladder. And so this is just basically a storage organ is all it is. And then when it's full, we're going to feel a need to evacuate the bladder if it's an appropriate time, allow urine to flow to the outside. So that's kind of what it's all about. So here's that model that matches sort of the urinary system. So again, two kidneys. So here are the kidneys, two ureters. Here are the ureters, a urinary bladder, and then you can't see much of it, but the urethra right here. Well, this particular model is of a male. The male looks different from the female. The male has some structures that females don't have. And so one of those structures is that um, the, the urethra in a male is long. So we have a long urethra, and it's a shared tube. It's shared by both the urinary and the reproductive system. And so it, it goes through the reproductive system. And so when we look down here, what we're going to see are parts of the male reproductive system. So these little white tubes that you see, those are what's called the ductus deferens. So the ductus deferens or vas deferens, they're going to be carrying sperm. And then if you look a little further down here, you're going to see these sort of yellow-like structure. Those are seminal vesicles. And seminal vesicles make a fluid that helps to nourish the sperm. And then if you look down here at the very bottom, you'll see the prostate gland. And that also makes a fluid which has to do with um, making the sperm able to move, so on, and reducing clot. And so if we were to look at this on a female, we wouldn't see any of these structures. So this is definitely a male reproductive system. It is, I mean, a urinary system. That doesn't really matter because uh, we're going to look at both of them, but I wouldn't want you to be confused.
So the first thing we're going to talk about are the kidneys. And so the kidneys are the ones that are doing the job of this urinary formation. So they're the most important part of the urinary system. Well, we have two kidneys. And if you look at them, this is where they're located. And so look, there's one kidney. That's the left one. But look at the right one. Look how far down it hangs. About a third of it hangs down below the level of the ribs. So this one is more protected than this one is because this one is no bone here. And so it's less protected. And so if you were to get hit in the back, especially on the right side, you can cause this kidney to rupture. And if you don't do something very quickly, you'd actually bleed to death because there's a ton of blood vessels in the kidney. So there's, a, there's some things that help protect the kidneys that aren't bone. So let's look at that. So if you do a transverse section through the abdominal cavity, and you can see the kidneys in here. So here are the two kidneys. Here's one and here's one. Well. That not only do we have bone on this side, you can see it over here, but there's also a thick layer of fat. Same thing on the other side. There's this thick layer of fat, and that fat, which is called renal adipose tissue, remember adipose tissue is very, very shock absorbing. It's cushioning, and so it helps to cushion and absorb the shock, and so it helps to protect these kidneys. Another thing it does is it attaches the kidney to the back of the abdominal cavity, to the posterior abdominal wall. So not only does it cushion and protect it, that adipose tissue also holds the kidneys in place. And so it's a really, really important uh, layer of this adipose tissue. Not only is there adipose tissue, but there's also di uh, thick connective tissue here. This connective tissue is called the renal fascia. So we have a renal fascia on the back side, which holds it in place. There's also a renal fascia on the front side. And then we have this renal adipose tissue as well. There's something else that's interesting when you look at this picture. Here's the peritoneal cavity. Well, the kidneys are not inside the peritoneal cavity. Remember when we looked at the stomach and all those things, they're inside this peritoneal cavity, but the kidneys are not. They're behind it. So the kidneys are said to be retroperitoneal. They're behind the peritoneal cavity. So they don't have a serosa like those other organs do. Well, if you look at a kidney, it looks like this. They look like kidney beans. That's why kidney beans are called that, because they look like kidneys. And look, they have this indented area right here. And this indented area, which is this right here, is called the hilus. And so look what we have at the hilus. There's blood vessels, there's an artery and a vein, and there's also a ureter. And that's where they enter or leave the kidney. So there's our ureter right there, and there's the blood vessels right there. And so this is that hilus. So when you look in here, there's a lot of stuff in here. And it's kind of overwhelming when you look at it, this picture. So we're going to take it and do it a little bit at a time. So let's look at it. First of all, the kidney has layers to it. It has three layers. So there's an outer layer, which is just very thin, dense, irregular connective tissue. It's sort of a reddish brown color. It's called the renal capsule. And that goes all the way around. So here's the renal capsule, and here's the renal capsule. It goes all the way around. And then there's a layer right underneath it that pretty much looks the same, no matter where you look. It's sort of grainy looking when you look at it, but it's this layer right here. This layer is called the cortex. 
the renal cortex. And then there's a layer that's deeper than that, this layer right here, which does not look the same as you go around. Look, it has these dark red structures that look like this, and these lighter structures that look like this. This layer is called the medulla, the renal medulla. And if you look in the renal medulla, what you're going to see are these structures right here that look a little bit like pyramids. You know what a pyramid looks like? Remember, a pyramid sort of looks like this. And that's kind of what they look like. And so that's what they're called. They're called renal pyramids. And so if you look at it, we have a pyramid, a pyramid, a pyramid. And then in between the pyramids, we have something else. These structures don't look like pyramids. They look like straight up and down things. So they're called columns. So what we're going to have is pyramid, column, pyramid, column, pyramid, column, all the way around. So if we look at that on a model, it looks like this. So here's that outer layer right here. There's that capsule. And then here are our three layers. There's the cortex. There's the medulla. We also have, if we look, go back to our picture, besides having the cortex and the medulla, there's a hollow area right here. It's hollow. And it's where the urine collects. So urine comes out right here, and it collects in here. And so this fills up with urine before it enters the ureter and goes on down. This hollow space is called the pelvis, the renal pelvis. And the word pelvis actually means bowl. So it's like a bowl that's going to collect urine. And if we look on our model, we can see it right there. There's that hollow space. There is this pelvis. So. We have the capsule, we have the cortex, we have the medulla, and we have the pelvis. And then attached to that pelvis is the ureter. So the ureter is the tube that urine is going to go down to get to the urinary bladder. Any questions? Okay, well, like I said, if we look at this medulla, what we're going to see are these things called pyramids. So this is a pyramid right here. And it really does look like a pyramid. These are cut, so they look flat. But they're not flat. They're like a pyramid. Remember, it looks sort of like this. And that's what they look like. And if you go to the top of a pyramid, up here at the top, that part looks a little bit like a nipple. And the word for nipple is papilla. So at the top of every one of these pyramids is a papilla. And you can see a papilla right here. So there's a papilla. There's a papilla. Now, you can't see this one or this one or this one because they're covered up. But inside right there is a papilla. And inside right there is a papilla and so on. Every one of these has a papilla. And then, remember, between the pyramids are columns. So there's a column. And we notice blood vessels run up the columns. We're going to talk about blood vessels a little bit more in a little bit. But they run up these columns. Remember, we have these hollow spaces. Remember, it's called the pelvis. But the pelvis is out here where it's one big hollow space. It's a little bit, though, like a tree. 
it looks like this. They accumulate until they get to one big hollow space, and that's the pelvis. But these are not called the pelvis. These are called calyces. And the word calyx, that's singular, means cup. So we had a bowl. Now we have cups. And we have a little cup. And we have a big cup. So what we have are minor calyces and major calyces. So here's a minor right here. And here's a minor. And here's a minor. But when they join together like this, they create a major. When they join together like this, they create a major. And so urine flows from the minor calyx to the major calyx to the pelvis. So it basically flows from a little cup to a big cup to a bowl. And then from there, it flows down into the ureter. So Deli asks, is the renal column different from the pyramid? And the pyramids contain the patil, patil, uh, papilla. Exactly. So let's go back to this other picture over here. So here are pyramids. That's a pyramid. So, and then the top of the pyramid is the papilla right there. This is a column. There's a pyramid, there's our papilla, and then this is a column. There's the pyramid, there's the papilla, this is a column. So pyramids and columns are not the same thing. They don't even look alike. Look, there's the pyramid, there's the column. They don't look anything alike. But pyramids and columns are both part of this medulla. And then, remember, we have these papillae. Those are the tops of the pyramids. And then surrounding the, the papilla is a minor calyx. So if we look at this picture right here, look, there's the papilla. And here is the minor calyx right here. So there's the papilla right there. And here is the minor calyx right here. So this one's been cut, which means that this is a minor calyx. And if we looked inside it, we would see a papilla. So the minor calyx surrounds the papilla. So there's another one, and it's surrounding a papilla. There's another one that's surrounding a papilla. There's another one. And this is a minor calyx right here. And the papilla would go down in there like that. Well, look at this minor calyx you can see that it has holes in it. That's what those little dots are. Those are holes. Well, those are actually the openings to little tiny tubes that run through the papilla. Those little tubes are called papillary ducts. And we'll talk about those a little bit later on. But urine is going to flow through there into here, from there, into here, and from there, into here. Any questions? So if we blow it up even more, there's our pyramids, there's our minor calyces, Remember these little holes here? That's 
the end of a papilla. Blow it up even more. Again, pyramid, minor calyx, major calyx, pelvis. There's our end of our papilla right there, and there's our column. So in this picture, you can see it very well. So this is the pyramid. There's another one right there. And this is the column. It's between the pyramids. And then up here, there's the papilla right there. There's the papilla right there. And running through the papilla are these little papillary ducts. And you can see these papillary ducts right here. That's what the openings are right there. Those are. So that is a papilla. This is what it really looks like. It's a little harder to see, um, but we can see those things. Okay, well, remember the job of the kidney is all about blood. It's to filter this blood. And it filters it, remember, about 60 times a day, which means it's going to need a lot of blood. It's going to need a big, big blood supply. And so if you look at it, there are a lot of arteries that go through here. So the first artery is called the renal artery, and the renal artery comes right off of the aorta. So here's the aorta right here. And then here are those two renal arteries. They're very large arteries, so they have a very high blood pressure. Remember when we talked about blood pressure, how it goes up and down, up and down, the further you get away. Well, here's the aorta right here, and here's the renal artery. So the blood pressure in the renal artery is very high. And then look what happens to the blood, the blood vessels. They divide, and then they divide, and they divide, and they divide, and they divide, and they get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And so we can see that here. And so if we look at these blood vessels, every time that it splits, the name changes. So look, it's split right there. The name changes. It splits right here. The name changes. It splits right there. The name changes. Every time it splits, the name changes. So if we look at these blood vessels, we can see them on these models. And so let's look at them. Here's the order they go in. And you can come back to this slide and use it as a reference or a summary of what the blood vessels are, are doing. And if you look here, look, there's the renal artery, and it's going to come all the way until we get to the renal vein. In other words, it's going to come in, it's going to go through here, divide, 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 and then it's going to come back and go out this way. And so we're going to learn these arteries. Well, it's easiest to learn them if you just learn them in order. So the first artery here is this renal artery. And so we're going to go in and remember every time it splits, the name is going to change. So we're going to go from renal artery to this one, which is called the segmental artery. And then we're going to follow it until it splits. Look, they split here. And so we're going to get these arteries. Well, look, these fan out, and they run up the columns. And what they do is they divide the, the kidney into lobes. So they run between the lobes of the kidney, so they're called interlobar. So we have renal artery, segmental artery, interlobar artery, between lobes. And if we follow those up, we're going to wind up right here. 
Make sense? Well, now look what happens to the artery. The artery splits again, and it makes a curve in each direction. So in other words, it's going to split, and part of it's going to go this way, and part of it's going to go this way. And look what it looks like. It looks like sort of an arc. An arc. So these arteries are called arcuate because they look like arts. And then if we follow them, that's these, we're going to get to these out here. So here's our interlobar, these, and then they're going to make this curve right here, and we're going to get these arcuate. And then if we follow the arcuate, look, they fan out again the next time they divide. And they divide this kidney up into lobules, not lobes, but lobules. And so these are called interlobular arteries. Make sense? And then what we're going to do is we're going to turn around and come back out by way of veins. So look, the veins run right next to the arteries. There's an artery, there's a vein, there's an artery, there's a vein, there's an artery, there's a vein. And basically they're going to have exactly the same names. So remember these were interlobular arteries, so that's what that is. So right next to it is going to be an interlobular vein. These were arcuate arteries, so right next to it is going to be an arcuate vein. These were interlobar arteries, so right next to it is an interlobar vein. The only difference is we have segmental arteries, but there are no segmental veins. And so these inter Low bar veins are going to drain directly into our renal vein. So if we look at that, it looks like this. Interlobular vein, arcuate vein. Interlobar vein into the renal vein. And we're going to be back out. Make sense? Any questions? Well, look at this model. So here is the whole kidney right here. Well, look, remember that's a pyramid right there. What if I were to take that and blow it up? I would get this. So look, there's the capsule right there. Here's the cortex right here. And here's the medulla right here. And remember, the medulla has these pyramids, and that's what we're looking at. So this is a pyramid right here. And if we follow a pyramid to the tip, remember, we're going to have that nipple. There's a papilla right there. So if we blow this up, it looks like this. And so these blood vessels are going through here. Well, over here is where our column is. And so the blood vessels that go up the column, remember, are interlobar. So there's our interlobar artery. And here's our interlobar vein. So soon says, then more blood from arteries get filtered than from veins. I see, now that's just the model, soon. 
that doesn't really mean that. Um, but we're going to see that more fluid comes into the kidney than goes out because we're going to make urine. Uh, let's don't. That's just the model. Don't let that confuse you. But remember, here is our interlobar artery right here and our interlobar vein right there. Well, there they are right there. There's the interlobar artery and the interlobar vein. There's our arcuate artery and arcuate vein. There they are right there, arcuate artery and arcuate vein. Here's our interlobular artery and interlobular vein. There they are right there. There's the interlobular artery and interlobular vein. So if we blow that up and look at it, we can see it. So interlobar artery. Right next to it is the interlobar vein. These are making that arc. So there's the arcuate artery and the arcuate vein. And then coming off of this is these interlobular arteries. So these are interlobular arteries. And over here we see an interlobular vein. Well, look at this. We go back to this picture again. See all these little dots over here? All those little dots? Well, those dots are these dots. And if I took one of these dots and blew it up, I would get this. So let's look at that. It looks like this. We'll come back to it in just a second. Well, let's look at it on this model. There they are right here. That's these dots. Well, what these dots are, are little capsules. And inside the capsules are blood vessels. So look, we have more blood vessels. And so if we look at this, remember this is the interlobar artery, interlobar vein, arcuate artery, arcuate vein, interlobular artery, and interlobular vein. We know that already. Well, look, coming off of this interlobular artery are even smaller arteries and they go toward this capsule, toward the capsule, toward the capsule. And the word for toward is afferent. So these are afferent. And they're the smallest arteries, so they're afferent arterioles. And look, what we're going to see is when it goes into the capsule, look at this. This is a capillary bed. It's a ball of capillaries inside the capsule. The word for ball is glomerulus. So these are called glomerular capillaries. Capillaries. And then look, there's another vessel coming out of the capsule, coming out of the capsule, coming out of the capsule. If it goes in, it's afferent, afferent, afferent. But if it comes out, it's efferent. So we have an efferent arteriole. Now it's weird that there's an arteriole and not a venule, but the kidney's the only place where that's like that. But look, we have the afferent arteriole, afferent, afferent, and then right here's the glomerular capillaries. Inside there's the glomerular capillaries, glomerular capillaries, afferent glomerular capillaries, afferent glomerular capillaries. And then coming out is the efferent arteriole, efferent arteriole. So look at that. We see it here.
So, toward the capsule, afferent. Away from the capsule, efferent. And then we're going to have capillaries. So these are capillaries, and these are capillaries. So these capillaries are around a tube. So they're called peritubular capillaries. Here's the tube over here. We're going to talk about it in a second. But the tube is in here, and they're around that tube. These are straight capillaries, which is kind of odd. But they're called vasa recta. Recta means straight. So, there's our afferent, there's our glomerular capillaries, and there's our efferent, and then we have the paratubular capillaries and the vasa recta. Well, if we blow this up, this is one of these right here, or one of these right here. If we blow it up, it looks like this. So look, there's the afferent arteriole. There's the efferent arteriole. And there's the glomerular capillaries. Any questions? So, it looks like that. This picture is messed up, but this is just the order that they go in. And if you do this on the PowerPoint, you can click and each one of these will show one at a time. But it's basically just the order that we were talking about all the way through. Okay, so that's just the general stuff about the, the kidney. Let's look at the nephron. So the nephron is the part of the kidney that does what the kidney does. In other words, it's the structural and functional unit of the kidney. So this is where urine is produced. So this is where we get urine formation. So this is where we're going to filter the blood and we're going to take the stuff out we don't want and put stuff back in that we want to keep. And that happens at the nephron. Well, nephrons are microscopic. You can't see them with your naked eye. And there's a bunch of them. There's about a million of them in each kidney. They come in two types. They're these short ones, which are called cortical. They're short. And then there's these long ones, which are called juxtamedullary. And they're long. And we'll see those in just a second. But look at them. There are different parts to these nephrons. In fact, there are three parts to the nephron. There's our cortical, and there's our juxtamedullary. And look in here, we can see blood vessels, but we can also see a tube in here. There's also a part that regulates flow in here. So there's three parts to these things. There is a vascular portion, that's the blood vessels, and we basically have already looked at that. There's a tubular portion, a long tube, and then there's a regulatory portion, which is going to control the flow through here. Let's look at the tubular portion first. So the tubular portion starts with this capsule right here, and then look, it's a long tube. And what's going to happen is fluid is going to move through here. And as fluid moves through here, we're going to take stuff out, stuff we want to keep. 
and then we're going to put stuff in here that we don't like and we want to get rid of. And what's going to happen is by the time you get all the way down here, what we're going to have is urine. So the nephron is where urine is produced. So here is the tubular portion of the nephron. And it starts with a capsule. It's sort of like a cup. It's called Bowman's capsule. It's also called the glomerular capsule. But then, look, there's a long tube. And different sections of the tube have different names. So the first part of the tube is this short, twisted section. It's right next to Bowman's capsule, so it's called proximal. Remember, proximal means close to. It's twisted. So it's usually called a proximal convoluted tubule. Or you can just call it the proximal tubule. And then there's a section that looks a lot like a hairpin. And it goes down and it comes back up. It goes down and it comes back up. It's called the loop of Henley. Sometimes the nephron loop. And the part that goes down is called the descending limb or descending part and the part that goes up is the ascending limb or ascending part and then we have another twisted tubule it's just like that other one almost it's convoluted but it's not close to it's far from bowman's capsule so it's called the distal convoluted tubule or distal tubule and then finally, we have this tube, which a bunch of these distal tubules are going to connect to. That's called the collecting duct. So those are the different parts of it. And we can see every one of them here. And so if we look here, there is Bowman's capsule right there. And there's the proximal convoluted tubule. There's the loop of Henley. Descending loop. Ascending, look, there's the distal convoluted tubule, and then there's the collecting duct. Remember, we have two types of nephrons. Short ones. This is a short one. Look, it's short. That's the cortical. This one is long. Look, it even goes off the picture. That's the juxtamedullary. Except for being short and long, they're exactly the same. So they're going to have all those same parts. Again, we're going to start with Bowman's capsule, and then we're going to have the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henley with the descending limb and the ascending limb, and then the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. So when we look here, I hope that you can figure those out already. But there's our cortical nephron, short. There's our juxtamedullary nephron, long. Other than that, they're the same, basically. And so we got these different parts. So there is Bowman's capsule. There is proximal convoluted tubule. There is the descending limb of the loop of Henley. And then the ascending limb of the loop of Henley. And then the distal convoluted tubule. And then the collecting duct. Well, if we took and blew that up, we already saw this before. Remember, here's our afferent arteriole, here's our glomerular capillaries, and then there's our efferent arteriole. Well, look, there's Bowman's capsule. And then here is the proximal convoluted tubule. And then you can't see where it goes, but if you went down this way, it would go to... Um, 
the loop of Henle descending and ascending, and then way up here, there's the distal convoluted tubule. So there's all that. Any questions about the decent or the tubular portion of the loop of Henley and or sorry of the nephron? Can everybody label the different parts of the tubular portion? And there again, we can see that. Let's look at the vascular portion. In reality, we already have, but let's go back and look at it again. So the vascular portion is the blood vessels. And so when we look at the blood vessels, there they are right there. So the descending loop and the descending, yes, those two things are the same, look new. So here's our vascular portion, it's blood vessels. So it's going to start with the afferent arteriole, and that's that there. And then it's going to go into here where we have this ball of capillaries. Remember the word for ball is glomerulus, so glomerular capillaries. And then coming out of it is the efferent arteriole. And then we have these capillaries, which are around the tube. So they're called paratubular capillaries. And then when they hang way down and they're straight, they're called vasa recta. So there's our glomerular capillaries right there. There they are right there. And you can't see them, but they're also here and here. They're inside every one of these. They come off of this afferent arterio. And then we're going to have the efferent arterio. And then the paratubular capillaries, that's all of these over here. And the vasa recta, that's all of these down here. So, afferent arteriole, glomerular capillaries, efferent arteriole, and remember this is Bowman's capsule. Well, let's take a look at Bowman's capsule. Bowman's capsule has two layers. Here's a layer, but this is also a layer. Look, it's wrapped around capillaries. If it wasn't wrapped around the capillaries, this is what the capillaries would look like. See all these tiny little holes? If you remember capillaries, these are fenestrated capillaries. They have those pores or windows. But they're not naked like this. They're covered up. And they're covered up with this. So there's two layers to Bowman's capsule, two layers. There's a parietal layer because it's not touching an organ. And then there's a visceral layer because it's touching these capsules, I mean these capillaries. Well, if you look at what the parietal layer is made out of, it's simple squamous epithelium. Look at these cells, they look like fried eggs. And it's just one layer of cells. You can see one layer right here. Simple squamous. But these cells are different. These cells are called podocytes. Podocytes are special cells because they have feet. They look like this, sort of. And they have feet. So they're called foot cells. Podocytes means foot cells. So podocytes, let's look at the podocytes. So again, we have two layers. We have this parietal layer, and the parietal layer, remember, is simple squamous epithelium. There it is, right there. And then we have the visceral layer, and it's these special cells called podocytes. 
Well, if you look at podocytes, this is what they look like. These yellow cells here are podocytes. Look, they have a part where the nucleus is. That's this part. There's the nucleus. And then they have these feet. They stick out like this, these feet. And these feet, what they do is they interdigitate. It's almost like if you take your fingers on one hand and lace it with the fingers on the other hand. You lace them together. You interdigitate them. That's what happens here. So one of these will interdigitate with another one like this. And what you get are little bitty spaces in between these interditations. And these little spaces are called filtration slits. So look at this over here. There's the little feet right there. Look how they're interdigitated. This goes in here and this goes in here like this. And little tiny spaces are created in here. Those are those filtration slits. And you can see them over here. There's the nucleus and the cell body. Here's all of these little feet. The feet are called pedicels. So these are pedicels right here. And remember, in between them are little spaces, which are called filtration slits. So we go back and look at it here. Here are the little feet. And they're interdigitated with each other. And the little line where the red line is represents the little space, the filtration slits. There's the nucleus, but it's a big cell with all of these feet that are interdigitated. Sort of like lacing your fingers together with your two hands. And so they look like this. So under a light microscope, there's the outer layer, that simple squamous epithelium. Here's that inner layer with these podocytes. Podocytes, and they're wrapped around the capillary, just this, wrapped around it, just like this. And so if you see the capillary, there's our little fenestrations right there, those little holes. And then here are the little filtration slits. That's in here. And so what's going to happen is blood is going to get pushed against that and fluid is going to go through those little holes and wind up in here. Well, we need to regulate the amount of fluid that's produced. So a third part to this nephron, and that's the regulatory portion. So look, there's our nephron right there. There's Bowman's capsule. There's our proximal convoluted tubule. There's the loop of Henle descending and ascending. And here's the distal convoluted tubule. Well, look what happens. The distal convoluted tubule and the afferent arteriole wind up touching each other right here. If you blow that up, look, you can see where they touch each other right there. This is called the JG apparatus or juxtaglomerula. Juxta means next to. And it's right next to the glomerular capillaries and the glomerular capsule is next to. And there it is. If we blow that up, it looks like this. So look, here's the parietal layer of 
Bowman's capsule. There's our blood vessels in the little capillaries, and these yellow things are our podocytes out here. So there's proximal convoluted tubule, and if we follow it around, it comes all the way to here. Here's our distal convoluted tubule. This is our afferent arteriole, and look, they touch each other right here. And where they touch each other is this JG apparatus. So if I blow that up again, it looks like this under a microscope. So there's afferent arteriole, and there's the distal convoluted tubule. And look, they touch each other right here. That's our JG apparatus. Here's our afferent arteriole. And there's our distal convoluted tubule where they touch each other right here is that JG apparatus. And if we look at it, we can see two different types of cells. On the afferent arteriole, we're going to see these special cells. They're bigger than normal and they have granules in them. They're still muscle cells, but they're different than normal. They're called JG cells. And if we look on our distal convoluted tubule, well, if you look over here, the cells are cuboidal. But over here, they're columnar. And not only are they columnar, they're densely packed together. And so those are called macula densa cells. So two different types of cells in this JG apparatus. On the afferent arteriole, we have JG cells. On the distal convoluted tubule, we have macula densa cells. We go back to our photomicrograph. There they are right there. There's the JG cells, these. And right there, these are our macula densa cells. So these cells are going to regulate the flow through here. They're going to regulate the flow. So that's the kidneys. Anybody have any questions about the kidneys or about the nephron or anything to do with the nephron? Remember, there's three parts. There's a vascular portion. That's all the blood vessels. There's a tubular portion. That's that long tube. And then there's that regulatory portion, and that's that JG apparatus. Well, what we're going to do in this ureter is, or nephron, is we're going to make urine. And so what's going to happen is the urine is going to come out of here. We made it from blood, but it's not blood anymore. It's waste products and excess stuff, things we don't want anymore. That urine winds up in here. Remember, this is our minor calyx. And from there, it's going to go into here. That's our major calyx. And from there, it's going to go into here, which is the pelvis. And then it's going to go down these tubes, and these are the ureters. So let's look at the ureters. So if you look at a ureter in here, there it is right there. This is a ureter. Remember, they go all the way down to the urinary bladder. These are those ureters. There's two of them. If you do a section through them and look at them, though, they look like this. Look, they look very similar to the GI tract. Remember the GI tract had layers? We had a mucosa layer, a submucosa. We had layers of muscle. Same thing here. There's our mucosa right there. It's transitional epithelium. And it has a lamina propria, just like we saw before. Here is the submucosal layer right here. And then there's two layers of muscle. 
We have a circular layer and a longitudinal layer. What we don't have is a serosa. And remember the reason why is because the kidneys and these are retroperitoneal. They're behind the peritoneum. Since they're behind the peritoneum, there's no serous membrane there. So ureters have no serosa. They're similar in some way, I guess, to the uh, esophagus. Because what they have is, just like the esophagus, they have an adventitia, which is this dense connective tissue. But look, they have muscle. And so the muscle can force the urine down the tube. So even if you're laying down, even if you're standing on your head, urine can move down the tube. It's not dependent on gravity. We force it down the tube with muscle contractions. Now remember this model is a male. So remember we said if you look down here at the bottom, you're going to see these male reproductive structures. Those don't have anything to do with uh, urine production. But this ureter is going to go through down to the bladder here, just like in a female, but we're not going to have those other structures that we see on the female. But that's the ureters. Let's look at the urinary bladder, and then we'll look at the urethra. So here's the urinary bladder. And so remember, it's a storage organ. And so the urine comes down these ureters, and it fills up the bladder. But look at where the opening to the ureters are. It's not up here. It's here and here. And so the bladder fills from the bottom up, not from the top down. And so as it fills up, it pushes against the walls and creates a pressure. It stretches the walls. And there are nerves which are going to send that information to your brain to tell you that the bladder is full and you need to empty it. Well, if you look down here, you can see the openings to these ureters. There's two of them, one on each side. They're called ureteric orifices. So that's the opening to this ure ureter. It comes right here like this. Same thing on the other side. And then there's also an opening down here to the urethra. And that's called the urethral orifice. And so urine is going to flow through here and flow out. Well, look, a triangle gets created right here. And that triangle is called the trigon. So the trigon is this flat surface on the bottom of the bladder, and it acts almost like a slide like at a playground where a kid slide down the slide. And so urine tends to slide down the slide toward the urethral orifice. Well, here's the ureter then. And this is a female, ure uh, sorry, urethra. This is the urethra. And this is a female urethra. The female urethras have very, are very short. They only have one section, just one section. And it passes through the abdominal wall. Well, you don't want urine coming out all the time. And so there are, just like we saw with the digestive system, two sphincters. So remember we had an internal and external anal sphincter. Well, there's an internal and external uh, urethral sphincter as well. And just like we saw before, the internal is smooth muscle. So here's the internal right here. That's smooth muscle, and it's involuntary. 
But right here where it passes through the abdominal wall is skeletal muscle. That's the external sphincter, and that one is voluntary. Another thing you'll see if you look at the bladder, if it's empty, the inside of the bladder all folded up like an accordion. And these folds are called rugae, just like they were in the stomach. But as the bladder fills up, the rugae flatten out. Another thing is the tissue in here is the same as the tissue in the ureter. This tissue is transitional epithelium. And this tissue is transitional epithelium. Hopefully you remember that from A and P1. Let's look at the male. So the bladder of the male looks the same. So there's our ureteric orifices. There's our urethral orifice. There's our trigon. There's our... the Brugay, the transitional epithelium, and so on. But if you look at the rest of this, it does not look the same. So if you look at the urethra in the male, the urethra is long. So there's a long urethra, and it has three sections to it. And the section is named for where it goes. So the first part goes through this gland. The gland is called the prostate, so the section is called the prostatic urethra. This part here goes through the penis, and so it's either called the penile or spongy urethra. There's a little bitty section right here, though, where it goes through the abdominal wall, and that's called the membranous urethra. So three sections. The male, just like the female, has two sphincters. So the internal sphincter is right here. Again, smooth muscle, involuntary. The external sphincter is right here, right where it goes through the abdominal wall, skeletal muscle, and voluntary. There's one thing about the, the urinary bladder and the urethra. Well, we want the urine to be able to come out, but you don't want to have to depend on gravity. And so there's a layer of muscle that goes all the way around, very, very similar to what we see here. So there's a circular layer and a longitudinal layer of muscle just like here. You can see it on the bladder. That's what this is. And these two layers are sort of interlaced in each other. They have a name. It's called the detrusor muscle. So the detrusor muscle right here is what's going to contract and force the urine out the urethra. Same thing's true for the male. There's the detrusor muscle. It contracts and forces the urine out through the urethra. There's one other thing. The, the urinary bladder and urethra are also retroperitoneal. So the urinary bladder does not have a serosa. It also has an adventitia just like the ureters, adventitia. So again, this is a male, so we can see some male structures down here, but you can still see the kidney, you can see the ureters, you can see the urinary bladder. If you open up this model, you can see what we were talking about. There's the rugae. There's our trigon. You can also see the orifices um, 
here. Remember, you're eteric. And the urethral here. You can see the sphincters. There's the internal, and there's the external. There's the internal, and there's the external. And then remember the male, there's three sections. So here's a reproductive model. We haven't seen this model, but there's the bladder. And here's the urethra right here. And so there's the prostate. So that's the prostatic urethra. There's the penis. So that's the penile or spongy urethra. And right here, where it goes through the abdominal wall is this membraneous urethra. Here's another model, same thing. But here's our bladder. You can see the rugae. You can see the detrusor. You can see the trigon. There's that prostate, so prostatic urethra, membraneous urethra, penile or spongy urethra. Anybody have any questions? So that's the urinary system. So Deli asks, is it because women's urethras are shorter is the reason why women go to the restroom more often than men? I've heard this. Uh, it has nothing to do with urethra. It has to do with, with the bladder itself. But, you know, the truth is I don't think women go to the bathroom any more often than men do. Um, now, pregnant women do go to the bathroom a lot because think about there's this, this uterus here, and what it does is it gets bigger and heavier. It presses down on the, on the ur uh, urinary bladder. So instead of having as much room to fill up as you had before, you've only got this much room to fill up. And so, obviously, if you fill it up more often, you're going to have to go to the bathroom more often. But I don't think males and females actually go to the bathroom in any, any different in a, any amount of time. One thing about males is because the, the urethra goes through the prostate, as a male gets older, what tends to happen, and about 75% of males is this enlarges. You get this benign enlargement. So what it does is it pushes up against the bladder and makes less room for the bladder. But not only does it enlarge on the outside, it also enlarges on the inside. So it gets bigger in here, which closes this tube up. So if you look at middle-aged and older males, it's actually very difficult for them to go to the bathroom. They have to go to the bathroom more often because the bladder's smaller because of this being pushed in. And then when they try to force the fluid out, there's a smaller opening here. And so uh, it, it's harder for it to actually evacuate. So they wind up with double problems. They need to go more often, and then when they try to go, they have more difficulty. Females also have problems, though, because if when females get pregnant, like I said, it pushes down on here. And the more pregnancies they have, this can get pushed further and further and further down. Um, and so... Sometimes you can have uh, a collapsed uh, bladder. And so that then is very, very small and very difficult to, to um, you no know, room to fill up. Uh, another thing females have more often is they have more, more urinary infections than males do because they have this short urethra and it doesn't take bacteria very long to get through here and get into the bladder. New says in that problem of the male do they need to remove the thing that block? Well if it gets bad enough the answer would be yes. One way to do that is they do something almost like a little roto-rooter kind of thing. It's a a sort of little blade on a tube and they take and they extend it through here and they basically 
destroy the tissue here. And it can be done with laser. It can be done uh, with a blade. Now it's mostly with a laser. But, yeah, that can happen. Males, it completely closes the urethra completely. And so if it's completely closed, there's no way to evacuate the bladder at all. And so it's, they would have to have surgery to relieve that problem. Any other questions? Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.